Welcome to IJGIS November webinar. Today, I'm very happy to have Professor Sinjuli Camargo de Andrade and Professor Joa Porto de Albuquerque to talk about their recent publications in April 2020 on a very important topic. In this paper, they propose a very novel framework to use multi-criteria optimization and define the spatial granularity when we use social media data for urban analytics. And lately, we have received a lot of manuscripts that using social media data for urban analytics and we know that spatial granularity is the key issue of determining what kind of patterns and what kind of correlations we can conclude from the data. So um, I'm very happy that this paper get a really good review during our review process and we have these opportunities that have both authors coming here to share their thought. Uh, without further ado, uh, welcome professors and please start the presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Sidigley Camargo de Andrade. Currently, I am a professor at the Federal University of, the, of Paraná in Brazil. It's a pleasure to be here to uh, talking to this audience today. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. May, for your invitation to introduce our work at the IGGIS seminar series. I am very delighted to join here with my co-author and the former PhD supervisor, Dr. João Porto, to share some of the results that we achieved during my PhD study. So I think uh, our talk will advance in how to take the complexity of the real world environment into account in proxy of the urban social media analytics. And uh, John Porto, you'd like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sidney. And, and uh, many thanks uh, indeed uh, to May, uh, to the invitation to, uh, to give a talk today about our work uh, published in IJGIS. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm a professor in urban analytics, Joao Porto de Albuquerque at the University of Glasgow. Uh, having recently moved from the University of Warwick, I also uh, am the deputy director of the Urban Big Data Center in, in, in Glasgow, the School of Social and Political Sciences. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure uh, to, uh, to share uh, uh, with you this work uh, that came from, as, as Sidney just said, from his uh, PhD students, and also we'll talk in the end about uh, some follow-on work that uh, that came out of this and implications of uh, using uh, this work. So uh, I cannot to uh, I, I cannot forget to mention that this work also has the contribution of the other researchers, uh, Camilo Restrepo Estrada from the University of Antioquia, Colombia. Alexandre Del Bem, Julie Estrela, and uh, Carlos Morales, all from the University of São Paulo, Brazil, and uh, Julio, uh, Luis Nunes from the Federal Institute of São Paulo, uh, also in Brazil. Okay, uh, just to give an overview of the motivation of this paper, social media data has taken the attention of the researcher by American as a significant and rich source of knowledge for a variety of uh, urban studies in sizes in several key areas and applications uh, such as detection, monitoring, and the recognition of natural disasters, humanitarian crisis, and uh, ur urban planning. And this is linked to the concept of the sensing or cities as sensors and the other terminologies that permeate the literature. And that allowed us to look at the urban space from different, different perspectives and in a more granular way. And the 
the using social media source of analysis can be conducted since uh, it enable us to analyze the data over different perspective or spectrum looking at the figure uh, we have the dimension spatial temporal content and the structural that allow us to produce social signals that are capable of revealing uh, the spatial temporal distribution of an urban phenomenon. So, uh, social media data uh, being used, uh, also used a uh, complementary data source to official data in many GIS studies and the applications, for example, in flooding, uh, typhoons, and the earthquakes. Look at the figure in right, we can, we can see that the frequency of rain-related messages that we were extracted from Twitter uh, reflects the rainfall me measurements get from the weather radar. We can see that there is a similarity among and the, uh, among the peaks between the both time series. And this refle reflection of the rain events from social media. Uh, this context is our study case in the in the paper. So uh, a, a common strategy in social media analytics for urban studies is to assess the intensity of social media activity around a topic and then use this as a proxy signal to reveal the spatial temporal distribution of the uh, of a phenomenon. Now, for example, social responses of rainfall events as shown in the, the prior slide. Basically, is studies uh, assume a correlation between the aggregation thematic social media activity in an aerial unit and a given spatial temporal process or phenomenon. But to find out the error unit that better reflects the phenomenon from social media data is not a trivial task. And the uneven distribution across the urban space and bias in the production practices of the social media users uh, introduce many challenges to, uh, in, in rough terms, to match the error unity to, to the scale uh, that represents the, the phenomenon. Uh, we, we can see uh, in, the, uh, in the figure on top, the spatial arrangement, uh, arrangement for data aggregation is sensitive to the scale and the zoning effect. Uh, uh, and this is linked to the modified error unit problem, uh, which can produce different spatial patterns and the st statistical results. Uh, this problem is often omitted in social media analytics, special, especially in urban analytics that uses social media data around a topic to reflect the real world, real world spatial temporal phenomenon. Although there is some possible ways in the literature to determine the most suitable error unit by using computational techniques, they often optimize only one criterion. For example, uh, minimize or maximize a loss function of a linear regression model. But one criterion alone uh, may, uh, may not enough to determine the most suitable error unit. Uh, on the other hand, 
make decision in the uh, on the one hand, uh, making decision in the real world is often multi-criteria in nature. On the other hand, multi-criteria can lead to divergence and conflicts as we show in the bottom figure. Uh, we know that uh, the sum of the local indicator of uh, spatial autocorrelation uh, is proportional to a global indication. Uh, for example, uh, from local global morons I, uh, 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 obtain global morons, global morons I from local morons I. But this proportionality sometimes is not true when we assess the spatial heterogeneity or spatial instability of the local indicator across a space. In the figure, we can see uh, that the variance uh, changes depending on the spatial arrangement and the uh, height global indicator does not necessarily yields a low variance. Uh, for example, uh, the, the E1, uh, the first, uh, let's see. This, this is uh, uh, an example of divergence since it's uh, expected a lower, lower spatial variance for height spatial autocorrelation values. So, uh, different factors uh, may determine the choice uh, of an error unit of analysis, and this can lead to divergence and uh, thus make uh, the assessment a harder process for the uh, spatial analyst. And then some, some question arises here. Uh, how can we ensure that the optional spatial unity choosing suit, suitably characterize or represent the spatial process in accordance with a number of given criteria. And the, what's the optional spatial unity that should be used when there are multiple and conflicting criteria? Uh, well, and the, to help the spatial analysts to uh, choose a more realistic or consistent error unit of analysis, we propose a multi-criteria optimization framework. Basically, the framework con consists of three main processes. The first process is the mo modeling of the candidate error units from a range of potential errors units and a set of criteria. Uh, the number of uh, criteria and the candidate solution is, in broad terms, unlimited. But the spatial analyst, an analyst can reduce uh, through his or her knowledge about the project topic and the type of the analysis. For example, you know that the rain phenomenon is irregular and it continues across the space. And these constraints should be taken into account to propose the candidate error, error units. The second, the second process is, is the evaluation of the candidate error units from multi-criteria decision analysis algorithms that allow us to deal with criteria that conflict with each other. Right. Finally, uh, the, 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 the third process gets the output provided by the evaluation process and check out the consistency of the output by retesting or resampling re uh, methods such as bootstrap or jackknife methods. I, I think the, the key highlighted point here is how, 
how do we can choose an error unit that reflect a given phenomenon from the aggregate thematic and social media data? Uh, take into account uh, different uh, qualitative and quantitative criteria. So uh, we apply the uh, multi-criteria optimization framework within the context of uh, heavy rainfall patterns in the city of Sao Paulo, where the city uh, was partitioned into different sizes of hexagonal area units, but uh, other shapes or com combination of shapes could be used here. And uh, uh, each area unit aggregated a sort of rainfall signal that uh, was built on the basis of the rainfall data obtained from weather radars and tweeters and the tweets related to rainfall events. Uh, for details, uh, on how this rainfall signal was built uh, can be checked in the, in the paper, okay? Uh, but uh, what is important here is that we assess the area units on the basis of two criteria, global morons I and the coefficient, coefficient of the variation of local morons I. The first thing, the first thing uh, relies on the overall spatial pattern of social media activity, while the second uh, measure the overall, overall instability of variance of the local spatial patterns. Uh, as we can see in the, the bottom figure, the criteria are not proportional as the area unit change. And the, we want to find, the, find out the, which of these error units that reflect better the rain patterns through the optimization of, uh, of the, the two objective functions, uh, the maxima, maximize, maximize the global morons I and minimize the uh, coefficient of variation of local models I. Uh, that in, in our opinion, uh, both criteria analyzed together uh, and can describe the behavior of the rain events. Uh, uh, irregular and continuous in, in space. So, uh, apply a, a dominance-based method that sorts the area units into frontiers ordered from best to worst. The area units uh, of uh, 50 and the 30 uh, square kilometers were considered equal, equally good since they, they fall into the first frontier, frontier and they are more likely to provide more constant spatial patterns than the other units. And the area units of 50 and, 50 and 30 square kilometers fall within the first frontier because they, they dominate the others and other ones in both criteria. Uh, and the, uh, but the, the area unit of uh, 15 square kilometers dominate uh, the, the 30, 30 uh, square kilometers in terms of global models I, but uh, the opposite, opposite is the case for the coefficient of variation of uh, local morons I, who dominate is the, the, the area unit of uh, 30 square kilometers. Um, and uh, uh, it's important to mention that uh, 
the global Morons I, we, we, we want to maximize I, and the, the coefficient of variation of local Morons I minimizes. And to assess the robustness of the framework, we run the thousand times the framework and using the bootstrap method that introduces random resample, resampling or disturbance from the original data. And the errors, error, uh, and the error units of the 50 and 30 square kilometers remaining constant after, after the bootstrap method. Okay, uh, with this, uh, I think I, I introduce our, our paper. Uh, one of the advantages of this framework over the over others approach is that the, it described uh, approach described in the literature is that this framework it's uh, suitable for dealing with multiple object functions or criteria. Oh, so next, year, Dr. Van Porto will talk about the, our newest work, also published in JJS, and that uses this multi-criteria optimization framework to explain the social response pattern. Uh, Professor Van Porto. Thanks, Sidigley. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, so I'll take on from here. Uh, I think Sidigley introduced it very well, well our kind of like main draft of the paper and the ideas and then which is um, to look at the multi objective criteria um, optimization as a way to to try and, and and come to grips with the question of you know which spatial unit do you we use uh, and and I would like to to you know to pose the question now uh, which is you know uh, what why you know what why does it matter and, and why should we bother with with this question and also perhaps to look at this in a specific application context, which is really following from uh, from the same um, from the same uh, family of work which ha we have been um, involved with. So uh, the the question we we like to 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 ask is really what are the implications when looking at the kind of like the different um, op opportunities and options of spatial units to do this analysis of social media. What are the implications of urban inequalities, such as income, uh, in the aggregated partners, and and how to take it regular journeys into account? So I will come to why these questions are uh, in a minute, but uh, what, what I'd like to to uh, to get us into here is is really on the practicality of the application or or the implications of of of, uh, of choosing different spatial units for specific applications. So these applications we'll be looking here are related to kind of like to a series of work we have been conducting on uh, on looking at social media for flood monitoring. That's the bigger context, really. And and within this, we, we were interested in this idea of looking at rainfall patterns uh, because, you know, usually if you detect floods after they happen, you know, you can still use do uh, use data for good things, but actually it's, it's better to detect floods before they happen so that people can get prepared and then do something about it. So then, OK, but that's then tricky. How do you detect floods before they happen? If pe people are not tweet about flooding before it floods, you know, um, of course, but then they will tweet about the rainfall and, and strong rainfall patterns. And that's, you know, that was the key idea we've been pursuing with, with Sid Gley, uh for a couple of years and other students in, in the group. Uh, and, and, you know, in associated research projects. Um, and interestingly, there is a strong correlation we found. But then the devil lives in the details. And then we will look into really how representative is this to the kind of like to, to apply this to a number of cities, really. And, and then the questions of urban inequalities become very important because, you know, we, we, if we're looking at this in a practical application like flood monitoring, we have to be sure 
that we are not kind of like having implications in terms of uh, which groups uh, of kind of like differential implications for different groups or parts of the city. So, okay, so now, now we come to our main uh, city guide. Can you pass the next slide, please? Now we come to our main kind of like problem, which is urban inequalities. And this picture is kind of like a famous one from, from a photographer, a Brazilian photographer called Tuca Vieira, which I think is emblematic of urban inequalities, very has been strongly used for this. As you can see, you know, in Sao Paulo, in the city of Sao Paulo, big metropolis, uh, as, as, as you know, in Latin America, the, the largest city in Brazil. And you see two very contrasting realities in the picture. On the left hand side is a slum, you could call, a favela of Paraisopolis, um, very impoverished neighborhood uh, without durable housing. And on the right hand side, uh, a luxurious, uh, you know, um, uh, building with which even has kind of like pools everywhere, even in, in the balconies uh, of people and so on. So, you know, very, very different uh, realities living side by side. But really, that's that's one of the key challenges, I think, when we're looking at using social media in applications, especially in, the, in, in cities which are highly unequal, as in the global south, but also in other places uh, as well. Can you pass on, Sidley? And uh, and then we looked at this, that this is not only static, but also dynamic. So one of the interesting things when we're doing this paper, and then our co-author of this paper is also here present, René Westerholt, um, and, and uh, when we are working and discussing together on how to conceptualize, how to capture these inequalities, you know, and the effect they have in social media, one of the things, you know, that we will be uh, which is drawing on the kind of like spatial unit analysis we did before. But then one of the things was to say, okay, when we look at this different spatial unit analysis, um, what is the kind of like influx of people between them? Because we are interested not only analyzing the ge demographic factors that influence social media activity where people, you know, sleep, but actually, you know, a lot of people tweet or do kind of like social media activity from where they work or where they kind of like are during the daytime, which might be different from where they sleep, you know, and the census data only captures where they sleep. So how do we take that into account, this kind of like daytime geographies and, 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 and how to bring this together with the analysis of spatial units? So this picture here is a, is a, is a quite nice colorful map. So you, you can barely discern here the the uh, the shape of the city of Sao Paulo, which is you know it's it's perhaps a um, uh, you, that there is you you can see here in in the first picture on the uh, on the left hand top um, is with all the colors that is kind of like a sum of of the different zones of the city as, as they are usually divided and and then the kind of like the um, uh, this is derived from the or origin destination matrix of, you know, regular journeys or commuting flows, interurban flows. So you see on the red, which is the, you know, the one in the middle top, uh, that this is the center zone, you know, of São Paulo. And you see the center people, people who live in the center, they don't travel too far away, really, to work. Uh, and, and that is very different, though, from the people on the green, which is, you know, top right uh, hand side, which are in the north zone. And they try, they commute a little bit more downwards, you know. Um, so you, if you if you look at the purple pattern, which is uh, bottom uh, left hand side, um, then you see people in the south zone and they commute a lot and they come a lot to the center, you know. And, and the, the yellow, which is in the middle, uh, bottom uh, uh, row in the middle, then people in the um, east zone of the city, they travel longer distances because they come a lot to the center. So you can see a lot of the patterns of the city by this because, you know, they are quite concentrated. And then the uh, west side, which is blue, they also don't travel as much. So, the, you know, so that's that's kind of like interesting because we use the spatial unit analysis that we had done with the previous work with the multi criteria to look at the patterns and these patterns and how they are reflected both in this kind of like, you know, commuting as well and how to put both together. So both the inequalities and the commuting. So we, we use it a, 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 a spatially autoregressive model uh, which had actually the orange destination matrix or 
a, a derivation from a, a weight, a uh, special uh, weighting system that's de de derived from the origin, origin destination matrix as the spatial index. So you can see here the equation of the uh, of the SAR, uh, which we fitted, and we basically used, as you can see, population and income as both kind of like two main um, independent variables that we are of, uh, uh, that we are trying to. Uh, control for and to to look up for the uh, uh, influences and then these two which should influence directly where people are they also were kind of like considered within with our spatial weight math matrix uh, which is derived from this origin destination uh, divided by the population uh, uh, flows then uh, they kind of like you know would would account uh, this this in in this weighting scheme we would account for the kind of like you know incoming flows that have a different profile than uh, than where they live. So that is kind of like you know in short the applications. I will not go with a lot into details. If you are interested, this is another paper, different paper. So it's just kind of like a glance here and and a short. Um, uh, a short kind of like introduction just just to look with you to the implications of the previous work which is the main focus of today so can we pass on city please yeah so what's very interesting come coming out of this work is really when we look at this this is a, a two chloro choroplats here one in the left hand side and one in the right hand side the left hand side the choroplats or the blue kind of like you know uh, gradations it's income and you can already see that that is quite strong. The city of Sao Paulo has a very radial structure. So you see that income is really concentrated in the city center. So it's perhaps one of the high, most kind of like concentrated and most concentric distributions of income I've have seen in terms of cities. So you see the city center concentrates most of the high income uh, areas. And then you have kind of like intermediate area uh, areas which are kind of like, you know, still close to the center, um, but, but a little bit more affluent. And then you have like, you know, uh, a bit bit less affluent, I mean. And then you have kind of like really the, the outskirts, the, the more peri peripheral areas, which has really the more the private areas and also are uh, with less income. But if, if you see on the right hand side, the, the blue pattern is very different, is the population. And then it's very different. So you see, for example, the East Zone has a lot of the population, has much more than, than, than the center, for example. But what is interesting is then is the red bubbles. The red bubbles is, is, is then um, a, a correlation degree that we calculated between the degree of to what extent the social response in social media matches rainfall, actual rainfall events as measured by a radar. And the interesting thing uh, of this application is that because we could... Uh, because rainfall is something that for Sao Paulo, we did have quite, you know, granular reference data to compare. You know, we did have a micro radar in that city, not in all cities, uh, in Brazil, for example, this is available. But uh, we chose these applications because we really could compare both. And you see kind of like uh, this small chart, you know, the line chart on, on the left hand side. This is an example of one of these time series. You know, in the bottom you have the time series of Twitter activity, and uh, on on the top here you have the rainfall as measured by the uh, by the radar. So, based on a cross correlation between these two time series, uh, we de we derived kind of like a degree of social response, and this is what you can see in the bubbles. You know, the size of the bubbles is proportional to this degree of social response to rainfall events, and interestingly. If you see the, the map in the left hand side, it is striking that the highest income areas, they coincide with areas that has have a high degree of social response or how, how or, you know, in other in other words, the bubbles are the quality of the of the social media signal in terms of how well they reflect rainfall patterns. And you can see that for high income areas, this is very high. And for low income areas, this is low. So just with the contract in the right hand side, you can't see this coincidence of spatial patterns as clearly. You know? So the patterns in the in the uh, in the right hand side are, uh, you know, they don't, don't don't match with the population as you could explain expect. Let's say, okay, so where there are more people, then there is better signal in social media, for example. 
So then social media reflects better the brain because there are more people to tweet about it. That's not true, but you know, it, it's more important really where, uh, where the high income areas. And that's perhaps expected, but what we, we did um, is to show this both in, in numbers and, and perhaps you know, to show this very quantitatively, but also to use, you see these hexagons here, they use exactly the spatial unit sizes that were kind of like found to be optimal and to optimize kind of like the two types of, of, uh, of spatial associations that we, we were interested. So the, um, the global spatial autocorrelation with the global modern side and the minimization of the variation across the the uh the local modern side. Um, so that that was kind of like you know for us uh, uh, two variables we chose because of this application, which is about rainfall, and then rainfall you know tends to be contiguous in in some areas you know and to have consistency so to speak in 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 uh without a lot of disjointed and heterogeneity uh within kind of like the areas. Uh, that it occurs, although some convection convection rainfalls are quite quite interesting in terms of spatial patterns. But you know, based on on this kind of like on on the most common occurrences of rainfall, we derived these two as important metrics. Got the uh, hexagon unit sizes, and what what we are showing here is that that's quite important because you see, if you do a practical applications like this one in São Paulo, and and are not careful about the spatial unit size. What you might be getting is really both kind of like being overconfident about kind of like the quality and accuracy of this science, but also you might be having a stronger influence of the inequalities as we are seeing here. So, for example, if like this picture showed to us that that really kind of like if you look at uh, using social media to detect heavy rainfall, you'll be you'll be detecting very well heavy rainfall of the rich but not very well the heavy rainfall of the poor. And that is what is very clearly shown here in these maps. And then kind of like that, it has a stronger implications if, if we're thinking in urban analytics in general, that we have to really be ma more mindful about this intra-urban variation. And then I think starting with the spatial unit size is for us uh, be keeping careful to how we pick the spatial unit size um, and, and systematically really assess, um, it, it's a very important step towards this. Can we move to, to the next one, Sigli, please? Thanks. Yeah, and that's kind of like, you know, how, how, what, what like the conclusion of our talk and then our key takeaway. So first of all, we think that urban analytics studies, which use social media, but also many other sources, really data sources, especially kind of like, you know, point based data and, and punctual data sources like this, you know, they should explicitly consider, you know, these issues and the potential effects of the of the modifiable area unit problem, the, the, the famous MALP, but also kind of like being uh, being aware that, you know, this is not a, a, a there is no um, one size fits all here with the solution. You have to really assess it for your application, for your assumptions, your criteria, but also kind of like the framework we provided can can um, can be used and adapted to different sets of criteria as well. And then uh, they this would allow you to assess different shapes and sizes. You know, not like we only did here assesses the different sizes of hexagons, but actually nothing nothing prevents you from using kind of like a, 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 a the same framework to assess different shapes as well you know and then to assess for example usual administrative units um in terms of zoning uh and 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 then test kind of like what 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 is the effect on target metrics in in our case we use the local and global autocorrelation but you you could also use other types of indicators of uh, spatial heterogeneity and and especially the ones which match better you know the type of application and the our expectations about the patterns that you, that, that you have about the patterns uh, and the other two key takeaways are about this kind of like the implications when applying uh, these different things. So first of all, uh, intra-urban inequalities can have strong impacts uh, as we are seeing in the results of analytics and we have to really be careful about them uh, when and, and, and the implications of spatial unit sizes for 
uh, when, and how they combine or not with uh, 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 intra-urban inequalities of different sizes. But also that uh, inequalities we're talking about not only kind of like static things, but also the dynamics uh, of, of journeys across the space and, and what, the influ what influences they have in terms of the social media activity. This is very important. And I think our latest work uh, with René here and 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 uh, both me and Sidney Clay, but Sidney Clay is also the first author. But we we worked with with René as well in the in the author team and others. Um, uh, we we show that uh, this origin destination matrix can be used for spatially regularize, uh, or, or, or that means to account for regular traffic journeys or like commuting flows during daytime in the analysis of social media analytics. So. With this, I think we hope we hope we got uh, you interested in reading the papers if you if you haven't done, and and also in uh, in discussing more about these topics about you know inequality, spatial unit sizes, and 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 uh, intra-urban flows and their effect in urban analytics. And with that, back to you, May. I think for the questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for the uh, very interesting talk. I appreciate the uh, the insights uh, beyond what we paper have described. Um, and I wonder whether there's any questions from the audience. I think Rafael, Rafael. Oh, I'm sorry, Rafael. Please yeah. go ahead. Hi, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. And this is also a topic that really interests me. I've worked with that too, proposing also like something like this, but using crime data in Brazil, in, a, in, in cities in Brazil too. And um, my question, uh, uh, the paper is also very interesting. By the way. And, um, if you work at, like the, the optimal granularity that you estimated again was a little worse if you think of things like the that picture of Paraisopolis, for instance, where it's like very local variations, right? And you're talking about 30 kilometer squares for the for the for the optimal granularity. So I'm wondering uh, if you were to have a higher volume of data points of tweets, uh, would your algorithm prescribe a finer granularity? I don't know if you guys tested that. So that's a great question. Thank you, Rafael. Let, let me see if I got it right. So you're asking if, if you would have kind of like a high granularity in terms of the number of points, whether when we apply the the algorithm to optimize, you get kind of like more granular or less granular depending on the on the uh, on the availability of the data. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you have like more volume, if you have more volume of data, so more information, more data points, you can kind of like go finer and see more details. Like if that's something that the the algorithm will do, or it will still prescribe about the same. Uh, um, you know, 30 kilometers, for instance, uh, square. Yeah, thanks for this. I think, Sidigley, I will, I will leave you to, to, to perhaps compliment, but I think, uh, you know, from my perspective, what we did uh, is really um, when running uh, and, and assessing the different, you know, the, the, uh, the different degrees of spatial uh, autocorrelation in the data, we use it kind of like basically all of the uh, data that we had uh, of the points that we had in terms of really um, deriving uh, patterns from for each of the units of the aerial unit. So in a way, first there is an aggregation by aerial unit, and then we apply the kind of like the the um, the, or you calculate the index later. So that means that actually, you know, the number of points will influence on how well you are capturing kind of like, you know, a specific unit analysis. Um, but after we do this and aggregate it, the, cal the calculation of the, of the, uh, of the local uh, uh, autocorrelation indexes and, and the global ones, they, are, they run into the kind of like aggregated analysis already, or the aggregated kind of like, you know, in the, um, 
uh, 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 aggregated activity in social media, not the individual tweet. So that's what I wanted to say. But I, I think, you know, my expectation is that because we apply it both kind of like minimizing local uh, more uh, uh, variation and maximizing global, the idea was that maximizing global to see kind of like, you know, spatial dependence in the data, to see kind of like more in general, more clustered data. And to minimize local variation is, is really to, to take into account that, you know, that rainfall events, at least the types we are interested in, they will be more clustered, you know, uh, or have like, if, even if there are pocket clusters, there are still clusters, you know. So you don't have a lot of very... Um, uh, a very kind of like, you know, a, a, a spatial heterogeneous uh, pattern in which you don't have, you know, the, the results are not really, you know, contiguous at all, you know, because we're talking about rain and then, you know, rain has to condense in clouds and they are usually contiguous. And then in a way, th there is some contiguity, discontiguity, but not as much. So in a way, that is a bit of the assumption. So I think, you know, coming back to your questions, I think, it, you know, the more data you would have, you would capture better these type of, you know, patterns. And then, you know, if the patterns themselves are granular, you know, in, in, then the kind of like, then the result will be a bit more granular. If, I mean, if the episodes of rainfall are more granular, for example, if you have more convective rains that fall into part of the city and not in all of the city, then you would have kind of like, you know, more granular units. That would be my expectation you know, if, if the method is working correctly. I don't know, Sigla, if you want to complement on that. Uh, no, no, it, it's exactly the, the method is, is limited to represent the continuous phenomena. And discrete phenomena are very heterogeneous, heterogeneous phenomena. It's not uh, at the, it's possible, but it depends on the criteria and the the spatial unity uh, mm. what we need to represent uh, the phenomenon. But uh, the the multi criterion optimization framework is adequately for continuous phenomena. That's very interesting because the data set that I'm used to working with is crime data and crime data is kind of like the opposite it tends to cluster a lot and so you have like these very patchy sometimes or like very hot like you know very tight hot spots and areas with like very low crime and so it's not i mean it is i guess there is like an underlying continuous density that you could estimate but it's it seems to be way less continuous than rainfall i'd say and so it'd be, I'm curious about what would your algorithm generate in different cases, different phenomena, say, for instance, crime or, or something that is, the phenomena itself seems more granular. It's, I'm very curious to know uh, what would, would, you know, what would you get from that? So, if, yeah, that's. Anyway. A that sounds really interesting and, and maybe something for us to follow up on, but I think, uh, my first uh, instinct would be the first thing would be really for you to make your assumptions a bit clear about what is your expectation about the spatial patterns and then kind of like you know because you know you would have some basic domain knowledge and i think you know our framework has this embedded into it which is you know to define the criteria for the optimization first of all it is important to think about what is the application what is kind of like the types of patterns you are looking for and then kind of like look at okay how granular uh, should we choose here you know for these type of patterns you know so i think that the the framework would assist you in in kind of like you know assessing the options but there is a bit of domain knowledge first in in, in modeling how you would apply it and for example what kinds of like indicators you would use in your case which might be then different from the rainfall one and, and that that's exactly that that would be something interesting to discuss you know how how an application in a very different domain uh, could could work. So maybe something we could follow up on. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'll uh, I might email you guys because that that's some, an area that also interests me quite a lot. Uh, but right. Trevor, thank you so much. This was again very very interesting uh, talk and very interesting paper. I already had checked it beforehand. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Rafael, for the really interesting question. And anybody else have some comments or questions? All right. If, uh, I do have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I think it's really the, the spatial granularity is such a fundamental problem in GI science. Uh, but so far, most of research will uh, send us in the uh, presentation, you apply a constant spatial granularity to the entire study area. Um, is any thought on uh, how we might look at a dynamic uh, spatial granularity uh, to, to pick up the heterogeneity across the study area? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Thanks, my. I think one of the limitations of 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 the patient, or one of the things we, we didn't have kind of like power uh, uh, to to look into, is varying this the the zoning really. You know, we just varied here, as you said, we varied the size of the hexagons, but we applied kind of like uh, uh, you know the size of the hexagons homogeneously across the space, but uh, of this is not the only way of, of applying this framework. So we definitely could think about ways of dividing the urban space that would have kind of like different um, sizes of or in, in the different zones. And that could be possible, definitely, you know, like that could be combined with with more more insights for defining the size or for variating the size for generating the different candidates, you know. So in our framework, in terms of the application itself, it could remain the same. The, the the difference here would be how you generate the potential candidates, you know, because we just generated the the candidates by taking kind of like different uh, hexagon sizes and then applying it homogeneously. And then we compared about these candidates and then we calculated for each of these candidates and, and, and the indexes we we were, the indices we were um, interested on. But you could do the same, you know, say for uh for different zoning types in which you don't have a homogeneous size across the urban space you could do this really as you mean like you know you know it, I, I think it's a great point and it might well be that actually for example some areas in the in the more in the, in the peripheral areas which also are kind of like less you know in the south of sao paulo for example there are some big areas which are not that there's not of people living there and then you, you, we could have higher, you know, like a little bit more similar to the kind of like uh, uh, census type of of, of uh, definitions and 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 the of the sizes, isn't it? And we could combine this and first generate, you know, um, these these units uh, using a different method, and then assessing the implications similarly to to the way we did. So that would be a way of trying to come closer to this, or not applying kind of like homogeneously the same. Um, unit size across the whole urban space. So thanks for the question. That's that's really interesting. We, did, we haven't done that, but that that would be interesting to investigate. Yeah, um, I think that uh, if you don't mind a final thought, it's like we have dynamic uh, kernel density methods. And then if we can apply the local marine's eye in constraint by the global marine's eye to identify the size of hexagons, at different locations, and, and then use the uh, uh, an optimization to make that decision at different part of the region. And I think that would be really interesting to really find out uh, the the dynamic nature and the and also like if an area have a lot of tweets, then the representation of that tweets will be less than the uh, area have a very little tweets that every one tweets become much more representative at the conditions at those area. So in considering the sampling representativeness along with the local variability of the tweets to identify uh, the uh, aerial uh, has a spatially varied uh, granularity. I think that will be very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds really interesting. Indeed, indeed. This is one thing, you know, we when when doing the hexagons, we are conscious that, you know, if even if we vary the size in the, in this size, we will have kind of like, you know, some level of aggregation, but some areas will have much much more tweets than than other areas, uh which 
uh, we, we didn't take the quantity of being the indicator of anything uh, in, in the sense of really kind of like, you know, making of the quantity um, the, the, uh, the primary kind of like indicator for dividing. But as you say, that could be quite interesting as well to try and, and, and think about areas uh, which are more homogeneously covered as well. Yeah, that's, that's a great suggestion. Thank you very much. And then another element I found it really interesting, uh, but is the to look at the uh, comparison of the real rainfall or real flooding events to recognize the accuracy of or trustworthiness of tweets at different location, and then that will be as a reference for the future events that how much we should uh, should should account for the 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 trustworthiness of tweets from that location in in the future for example yeah that that's interesting that is a bit of what we actually were aiming at you know because when we calculated these <laughs> degrees of autocorrelation you know if, if you remember uh, the degrees of of uh, of correlation between the tweets and the official signals that was an interesting uh, uh, thing for our application because when we did that, we are thinking that, for example, for the areas in the center, we can have a highest trustworthiness for the signal that you extract from the tweet. Whereas from the areas in the periphery of the city, then then kind of like the signal is not very reliable because you know both because uh, may, maybe because people don't tweet about rainfall, but you know, or maybe because, you know, they tweet with using different words, you know, there is more noise and then we can't really take the signal with the methods we used and just use them in the same form. So in a way, that's exactly the good thing about the rainfall is that there is a reference data that we can really assess trustworthiness in, in a specific way, but also we can learn this for the future, for future events in which you don't, you are not as rich in terms of the areas as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. And any other comments or questions? All right, well, um, thank you for coming. And I, I really thank Sinjari and Joanne to this excellent talk and then really give me thinking much more than uh, what I usually think about spatial granularity and social media data. And we uh, after this presentation, I will uh, post a, a recording to our YouTube channel. Um, and I, I welcome and invite everybody to continue interacting.